Hey everybody, thank you all for being here for the fourth and final installment of the Arkansas Native Plant Society's 2024 webinar series. We're very excited to have Justin Thomas back again uh, with us today for his talk titled The Amazing World of Wild Plant Soil Interactions. For 26 years, Justin has conducted taxonomic and ecological research and instructed plant ecology and identification workshops for the Institute of Botanical Training and for Nature Site, which are both organizations that he and his spouse, Dana, have founded. He is the co-author of the Ecological Checklist of the Missouri Flora, is a research associate with the Missouri Botanical Garden, and is a taxonomic authority on the genus Dicanthalium. He also serves as a scientific advisor to several conservation organizations and promotes a holistic view of life as a system of study and inspiration. A recording of today's program will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and I encourage you to go on there, uh, type in Arkansas Native Plant Society, and you should find our channel, uh, along with all of the recordings from the past webinars we've given over the years. And if you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, I encourage you to do so by visiting our website, anps.org. Uh, joining the society is really simple, and you just could do it right there uh, on our website. If you have a PayPal account, just go to anps.org slash join, or you can mail a check to our treasurer, whose address is also up there on our site. Uh, if you want to follow our Facebook, we're on facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society, uh, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, on YouTube. Uh, so today, uh, Justin's going to continue uh, a little bit of uh, the, the theme that we've had with the, the previous webinar with Ben Benton, uh, where we're talking a little bit more about soil and the relationship uh, with soil and plants. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Justin. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the Arkansas Native Plant Society for hosting. You guys do do amazing webinars, and it's it's a it's an honor to be here doing another one. Um, it's it's always fun because I I kind of get to pick topics, and I often pick the topic that's kind of running through my mind or the 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 subject that I'm studying at the, at the moment, and it and it gives me gives me a a, a chance to condense that all into a logical argument or presentation, which I'm going to attempt to do here. Uh, the world of soils is horrible. No, it's, it's amazing. It's fantastically complex, and you could go a thousand different ways. So, so to get into the, all of the plant soil interactions uh, in the in the half hour forty minutes that we have here would, of course, be ridiculous. Um, but there's some sort of fascinating aspects that are big, big. Uh, big item processes that are in soils that that i've learned uh recently that are kind of easy to approach and kind of kind of fun to understand and maybe see the world with like i said i i, I do been doing mostly botanical work and i'm mostly a, a plant guy and have been for 20 years but only in the last few years have i have i delved into the soil aspects and I've, and it's become quite fascinating. I I love plants so much. I've I've soiled myself at this point. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, getting into the 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 the, the nitty gritty of uh, of soils them, themselves, largely because as as I start to understand ecological processes more, you start realizing how much they are driven by nutrient dynamics and of course, abiotic factors and, and things like that. And so understanding, especially like restoration processes, you really can't, I don't see how you can understand those processes without having an understanding of soil functionality, which is largely kind of what we're, what, what I'm going to hit on here. Um, we live in a, in a, in a world that has immense beauty, like from this, uh, from this, these are images from, around the Ozarks, pretty much uh, the top left, that's uh, the sort of Boot Heel Swamp, Boot Heel, Missouri, Northeast Arkansas, perhaps. But the rest of that's kind of White River Hills. The bottom right, that's uh, that's Flanagan Prairie down in Arkansas. Um, I'm, I'm in Springfield, Missouri right now. Um, but, but we live in a world where, where those sort of these, these, these complex ecological systems that sort of dominated the landscape for let's say millions of years 
humans have done this to them. We've we've simplified them. We've kind of stripped them down and 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 turned them into uh, productive uh, machinery uh, towards our own our own goals and initiatives. And say what you want about that. It's ultimately you know we're just we're just trying to feed ourselves and feed our children and and you know whatever drives us is irrelevant to the fact that that this sort of thing happens. But we're so we've so humanized, so populated the earth, we're starting to get that pushback from our habitat, which has become a global habitat, um pushing back. And so we're gonna have to start changing the way we do things and, and that's gonna push our understanding, our consciousness back into soil dynamics or these these sort of things that we're losing in order to preserve them, hopefully, and even restore the places that we haven't. So we're trying to find ways to be a more regenerative culture. I think that's what ecology is all about. I think that's what uh, regenerative agriculture is all about. It really should be what culture is all about. Um, it shouldn't. You shouldn't have to put regenerative in front of it. It should just be the way culture works, as as some cultures did and have uh, for millennia. Um, but if we're if we're if regenerative cultures are to live in regenerative communities, which we hope they will. We must have regenerative, regenerative awareness and consciousness. And what can teach us more about the regenerative than soil itself? Soil is, is sort of the place where recycling and regeneration happens in, in systems. Um, yeah, and, and so it, it begs the question, when you when you start looking at soil, start understanding the things that go into it. Where does soil begin and end? Uh, we we can think of soil as a you, know, you go out in your yard, you can pick up a handful of it, but it doesn't. the The soilness of it isn't just in that place. It's in the air. It's in the sun. It's in the his, history of the landscape. It's in the rocks of the landscape. Um, there's although we can have a physical soil. Soil itself is is more of a process, um, and one of the fascinating things you, you find when you start looking into into soil itself is soil really soil really is a link between the sky and the earth. Um, and, I, and I've written some notes here that I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just kind of adhere to, just to cover these cop these topics succinctly. Uh, plants plants link the sky and the earth and, and sort of if you if you took away the supernatural and the and the idea of an after, afterlife ecology and practice and experience is as functionally sacred as religion so you've got this this regenerative rebuilding cyclical relationship that is a regenerative and in a, in a sacred relationship in the sense that it is a functional relationship. And, and and people have termed that sort of a biophilia. A lot of people, especially like in, our, in Arkansas Native Plant Society or any Native Plant Society, probably feels the tug of biophilia, this love for nature and its relationships. Um, the, above, the above ground part of this relationship is soil is as much above ground as it, as it is below ground, just as when you see plants, they're below ground as much as they are above ground. So we kind of, to talk about soil to start off, we got to kind of talk about both. So the above ground parts, the, the photosynthetic parts, the plants, convert pho convert photons to protons. So they convert light into matter and basically create the biologically organic world. All life on Earth starts here. Life and the ecologies that emerge from it are solar powered. All the carbon and nitrogen and building blocks of in, of a living organism must be animated by light, catalyzing reactions, and electrifying tissues into action. So the, the above ground part of the ecology is you have light entering a system. That light is literally energy that is ev eventually drives metabolisms. It's the, the photosynthesis makes sugars, light from the sun, that energy came from the sun, and then in order for you to get up and make a cup of coffee, you're burning off sugars, plus putting a little more in your coffee. Uh, you're burning off those sugars as a catalyst. You know, that, that light is then released as warmth and energy. 
in your body. So here's this here's how light the animated enters the system. Uh, below ground uh, soils where the the building blocks of this dynamic are regenerated. Um, soils where renewal happens, it, it, it's driven by decay, which is really recycling and uh, of the things that were alive, that were created by the light of photosynthesis. L the light of photosynthesis drives metabolisms, which are driven by DNA, which is information. DNA assembles in, uh, amino acids and proteins that fuel metab that, that give the information to build new cells or to build a you know a, an arm or to make a seed or to make a root. That's all driven by light energy moving through the material world of carbon, nitrogen, just building blocks through an information system that is DNA that creates a living world. At some point, that living organism decays, say a leaf of a tree falls back to the to the earth, and soil breaks those building blocks back down and puts them back into the system as that system is again photosynthesized with light. So this this really is, I mean, it, 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 if it weren't real, if it wasn't reality, it would sound like an elaborate, magical, uh, oh fantasy book right it would sound like some, something something like lord of the rings but it's literally how how the system works but we it's funny we never really talk about it as animated building blocks across information systems of dna over long periods of time that actually learn and shape and adapt and evolve at all those scales across those systems pretty pretty fascinating stuff i think when you when you break it down that way um, people typically think of soils and what the average person knows about, about soil and plant interactions is that, that roots take up water and nutrients, or sorry, yeah, plants take up water and nutrients from the soil. And, you know, in school and biology class, you'll learn about like osmosis, that the, the water can move from the soil into roots by concentration gradients. Then there's capillary action, like, like, like when you put a paper towel on a drop of water and it absorbs and spreads that out just the just the natural process of one of the magical processes of water is that capillary action moves water through plants and then there's transpiration so as as leaves as plants evaporate out of their stomata the holes in their leaves that that water column is tugged from the bottom up and so it pulls water through it so, so plants are in essence this this uh this this medium through which water moves in the land it, from the soil into the sky and in the process that soil when it's wet becomes like a tea it becomes a becomes a tea of not just water but nutrients and all the things that are in that soil all the things that the microbes are making and all these very complex relationships that we'll get into a little bit more um that's essentially that's maybe the most that people know or usually know about how plants work, but they don't know about how that tea is made, right? And that's kind of what we're what we're gonna we're gonna touch on is that it's more than just you know more than just tea. It's it's many different forms and shapes and flavors and ingredients and microbia. Um very, very different, different uh different and very complex ways to which that can happen. Uh, a lot of people know soil just sort of through an agricultural understanding. They know that that you add fertilizer when things aren't productive, or we know it through gardening. We're like, well, you want to add fertilizer because you want high productivity. But in reality, real nature and in natural systems, uh, the most diverse and most rich ecological systems that we have are actually quite nutrient poor uh, because over periods of time, those nutrients nitrogen phosphorus potassium the main ones they, they get they get stored up into other complexes they get locked into tissues and in real nature or stable old growth sort of nature whether it's a grassland or or a forest woodland community um they're by definition oligotrophic which means low nutrients so there's not a lot of nutrients in nature and that's when in like fu functional old growth nature and that's when biodiversity is maximized 
because you 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 have all these elaborate relationships start having to be evolved that the way that the way that light takes the building blocks of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and runs them through genetic information systems has to adapt into behaviors that that make trade-offs and changes that make the system more elaborate and in essence make the system more uh, resilient as well we find um so so thinking of of soil from an agricultural perspective is really antithetical to to what actual healthy biological systems come come across come with and that's that's kind of the hard thing to talk about soils is 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 differentiating whether we mean healthy natural soils or whether we mean the degraded agricultural soils that we're be, we may be more familiar with it's funny because uh we've got a, a an organic farmer up the road that we get our csa from and we do work weeks up there and stuff and I, i've gotten to know him really well and when he's talking about farming on the orga organic farm i'm and i'm talking about ecology and wild nature we're talking about the same process that's that's how close to organic that's kind of the direction that that functional healthy organic farming kind of goes it builds soil it doesn't deplete soil which is which is wonderful um another sort of complex way to, to come across this that i like to think of it is is think of plants as emergent properties of soil like if you see plants anywhere wherever the plants are they're a product of that soil like the plants in the road ditch are different than the plants in the fescue field that are different from the prairie remnant you might have passed or the woods those plants are different because those soils are different and conversely, the soils are different because those plants are different. These are these. This is how how di how directly connected soil health, soil diversity, and plant health, and plant diversity, and then correspondingly, invertebrate health and and and, and plant uh, health. They're all they're all interrelated, all connected variables. Uh, and what defines us a, a healthy soil? Or what we see in really healthy old growth sort of soils that have a lot of biodiversity in them is there's a lot of bacteria, fungi, viruses, these these microbes. And then there's things like nematodes and worms and insect larvae and all these sort of things, all of which have a, a, a relationship in those soils that make up very complex, very uh, necessary parts of communities if we're trying to maintain rich, complex uh, communities, which I hope we are. Um, there are 17 essential elements in soils. So you learn about botany, you learn about plants, you learn about, there are 17 essential elements, like, you know, the big ones, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, but then there's also calcium and sulfur and magnesium and uh, zinc. And uh, there's 17 and copper, 17 elements that are necessary for for most plant life. Um, fun fact, none of those elements, calcium, car calcium, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, none of them can enter into a plant until they've been ionized or mineralized or some turned into some organ some some ionic uh, form, usually with some sort of a charge. And the only way that happens is through microbia. Like like you could put all the all the nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus you want on a garden, but if it's not in a in an oxidized, mineralized, uh, ionic form, it does absolutely nothing for plants. And the only way it gets there is through soil microbia. Um. So so it literally is plant health, the things that plants needs, only get into plants through microbia. The more microbia is in a is in a soil the more potential for health. Uh, a good example is a lot of old growth systems have uh, old growth, like high quality nature systems are often or can be associated with high zinc. And zinc only comes into systems through very complex microbial dynamics of a sort of hallmark of old growth systems. So you'd have to give a beat up old fescue field. Um, it may take a long time for that to ever develop the 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 microbial ability to get zinc into that living system. Uh, we also have sort of an ignorance of scale, as I'm I'm just kind of calling it here. 
we don't realize just how insanely amazing soil is. So like on the, on the image here, you've got a, a one gram of soil and that spoon is, is more like 20 grams. A, a, a gram of soil is about half a teaspoon. Um, but you've got within a, within a gram, a really small centimeter by centimeter, a, a cubic centimeter of soil, there can be thousands of different taxa, different species of microbes, worms, nematodes. There can be billions of bacterial cells, healthful, functional bacterial cells. And there can be hundreds of meters of fungal hyphae just in something that tiny. So, so when we talk about things like that, it sounds silly, but it, it kind of ha highlights how we, we would never guess that high, at least I wouldn't, um, not, not being a soils person. Um, and when you hear the real numbers, you're like, how is that even possible? <laughs> you know, how does that exist in one little gram of, of soil? And then you have things like these are these are the root hairs of a, of a grass plant growing in soil. So one annual rye plant is estimated. So we're talking like a clump of grass, maybe as big as a pie plate, and all of its roots in the soil. The root hairs on a small, just a single individual rye plant, if you took the root hairs, the little fine surface area hairs on those roots there, the fuzz, and you know split them down the middle, laid them out, and, and just made one entire flat surface of those root hairs on one rye plant, it would be roughly 4,300 square feet. That's over twice the size of my house, the floor plan, right? That's a, that's a tenth of an acre, just a one tiny little plant. So again, the scales of which these things are interacting, which is, it's hard for us to envision as, as skin covered animals that don't have surface area on the outside of our body, but inside our body, like in our gut and in our intestines, there are little, there are cilia and stuff like that that have maximized uh, surface area. So again, the ignorance of scale, we, we don't, I think the degree to which we don't understand how amazing soil is, is kind of the degree to which we also don't or can't understand the scale at which it's happening. Um, and so, um, some not so basic, but remedial soil plant interactions. This, this is one that I, I work with a lot is just sort of the way nutrients and the way microbes work in, in soils in a really, really simplified cartoonish sort of way. And so was, this will just be kind of a series of cartoony slides. They're not animated. I'm not that good. Oh, well, there's a little animation. Um, but if we, if we zone in on them, so we've got this old growth, say savanna woodland system, and we zoom in on a cross section of a long section of its soil here's kind of what we'd see we'd see plants and of, of a rich rich diversity uh, in the soil these are perennial plants long lived they've been there forever they're reproducing there you've got this ba these balanced healthful microbes in the soil those are the green dots that's just your healthy microbia that's doing things so, so we're talking fungi and bacteria that are they're doing the things you hear about a lot, especially lately, where the fungal hyphae are connecting things and plants are, are connecting roots and plants are sharing nutrients and communicating below ground. That's all happening through microbes in the soil, and it's happening a lot. Uh, it, you know, people try to poo-poo it, but in old growth, really old, stable grasslands, woodlands, forests, that is, that is a defining characteristic of, of those systems. And then you also have these nitrogen fixing bacteria. Well, let me back up. The green, the green dots, the, the regular sort of carbon eating microbia, they're just kind of there mostly trying to find carbon and building soil. But then there's a, a different group of bacteria that like to fix nitrogen. So they don't get light, they don't get energy from light or from carbon. They get it from things like nitrogen or some of them get it. They're chemotrophs, they get it from sulfur, uh, sort of these, sort of these things. So they want to find nitrogen and break it apart and get energy from that break. But in the process, they make things like ammonium, which is useful to ammonium and things like that that are useful to plants. So in healthy soils, there's not a lot of available nitrogen. So you don't have a lot of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, nitrate is, is the fix to nitrogen. <clears throat> so that's nitrogen that is fixed. Um, so that's, that's, that's the nitrogen. The red triangles are, are what plants want. They want those red... Uh, triangles that's the nitrogen in ionic form nitrate form 
Um, but they don't want too much of it. Too much of it can be toxic. You can give too much nitrogen to plants if you've had house plants and accidentally fertilize them too much or in your yard. You'll you'll find quickly that uh, you can overdo it. And then the blue triangles are, are these things called bacteriostatic compounds, like tannoids and things. Really complex. Each one of these, you know, green, yellow, red, blue, the shapes. We just need the purple horseshoes and we've got lucky charms. Uh, each one of these is very complex. And so, so this is a very simplified, but it's simplified enough that it's, it should still make sense. So bear with me. <laughs> but bacteriostatic compounds, it, it, if they're released by the plants, so plants are exuding into soil. All plants are doing this, but especially like old, mature, perennial plants. If you're in a prairie, big blue stem, little blue stem, if you're in woods, like oak woods, like white oaks, the dominant oak trees, they're definitely exuding these compounds in the soil. They're called bacteriostatic compounds. And that's just a big word that says that for a compound that stops the nitrogen fixing bacteria from fixing nitrogen, they don't want it to fix nitrogen until they, until they need nitrogen. And then they back off the bacteriostatic compounds and they let the nitrogen fi fixing bacteria go nuts a little bit and they'll start breaking down organic matter and then they stop it and they when it rains again that tea i was talking about a while ago they lap up that tea that is now full of nit nitrates or has nitrates but not a lot of nitrates so it's a very controlled process the more we look at it the more more we realize in old growth systems this is highly concerted and and so concerted that that other things have evolved around it so like nitrogen fixing in legumes legumes literally evolved because of this process nitrogen fixing and legumes evolved because they couldn't get access to the nitrogen because the free living soil nitrogen fixing bacteria were being controlled by dominant vegetation but legumes evolved little houses on their roots as little root nodules and inside of those roots they can control nitrogen fixing bacteria internally other plants have to do nitrogen fixation or have to use nitrogen fixing bacteria externally. So literally the explosion of legumes is one of the most diverse families on the planet. Plant physiologists agree in their papers published that that evolved because old growth soils are so nitrogen poor, which is again, fascinating. So that's how, that's how complex and how sort of, sort of, uh, codified, these these processes are okay so we've got this eco we've got this complex old growth system and it's just humming along and all the energy that enters the system is utilized and it's it's funneling and shunneling and and this system you know an old growth prairie will stay in old growth prairie woods will stay in old growth woods for when they're mature again don't picture our damaged landscape but picture picture eden landscapes um they're, they just perpetuate. They're, they're kind of just, they reach an equilibrium and they run on that equilibrium and something really major has to change to shift that equilibrium, uh, like an asteroid impact or something. Um, and so you've got these systems kind of cruising along and then say there is an impact, boom, uh, not a, not a, not a meteor sized impact, but say somebody comes along and a farmer comes to a, an old, uh, he buys a prairie and he's like, I want this prairie to be a cornfield. And so he glyphosates, roundup, kills all these weeds that he sees in this prairie uh, or it gets tilled up or something. So all of a sudden, we'll start at the bottom here, these bacteriostatic compounds. Notice the blue triangles are now gone. So that was the, those were the plants suppressing nitrogen fixing bacteria. So all of a sudden the bacteriostatic compounds pounds are gone so so nitrogen fixing bacteria can run amok they can go nuts on the organic matter that's built up in the soil so all of a sudden you get this flush of nitrogen fixing bacteria which in turn results in a flush of nitrate which is the usable form of uh, nitrogen for plants and then boom you get weeds going like crazy so this if you've seen if you've seen weedy landscapes, which we all have because we live in really weedy landscapes, or if you've seen like a really hot fire in woods and then something like burnweed flushes, 
that burnweed flush was was triggered by mortality caused to the perennial species, which results in a flush of nitrogen, which trigger literally triggers the seed. So these a lot of a lot of these nitrophilus plants, a lot of these early successional plants, these annuals in nature, they literally just sit dormant as seed and they have their seed coats have nitrogen sensing sometimes phosphorus. Again, this is more complex than we're letting on, but they have sensors in their seed coats that can tell from that tea, the wet, when it rains up through the soil, whether they should germinate or not. And so if you're an annual plant, you got one year to flower and die. And so you don't want to germinate unless you know there's a lot of nitrogen to fuel the kind of growth that you need. So that's, that's, a, that's that relationship you see is this flush of nitrate will result in a flush of annual species or of somewhat weedy species. It's why you don't want to see Farmer Joe buy a 10-acre prairie remnant and, and spray it with glyphosate because you know that's the end, right? And it's the end because you literally have this, we've kind of just broken down the whole system here. Notice I'm going to back up a slide, two slides. Notice the dark brown, that's sort of the, the humus, the organic matter in the soil. As the microbes are breaking it down, it's gone. And so that that was literally the fat and the home and the, the everything to that whole system was living in that sponge that was that organic matter in that soil. But through time, so we're going to go, okay, I've just lost myself. What the heck? Sorry. Let's go back to, we recognize this one. So this is the, this is the weedy explosion of annual sort of species. Now I'm going to go forward a slide. And so after time, the microbia run out of things to break down. They run out of organic matter to break down and the soil becomes very simplified and just becomes sort of a mineral remnants again, not much, not much, uh, persisting in it. There was, uh, recognizable of that organic soil or that organic dynamic that had been previous. And so it just kind of runs out of steam picture like, a Oh, an old field or something where somebody scraped it down to clay and then walked away and you just kind of get broom sedge and you get, the. Uh, the uh, poverty oats grass. There's no, there's no real organic layer. You can see red clay sticking up here and there. That's because there's nothing really for microbes or anything to build upon or to make soil out of these sort of systems. So you're really kind of starting all over again. And what happens when you're starting all over again is the nitrogen runs out. And when the nitrogen runs out, the plants that need nitrogen to live, they go dormant and they don't germinate, but other plants, that that level of nitrogen is, nitrogen is toxic to, they start colonizing. And so you get things like broom sedge and poverty oats grass. They're, they're not as nitrophilous and as early successional as uh, ragweed and burnweed and any of the plants with weed in, in, in the last, in the, in the, in their name, but they're just a little bit better, right? They're the first sort of, they're these, they're these sort of, first perennial colonizers, those organisms start popping in and they start stitching the system back together. And so here's an interesting, we're at, a, we're at this tipping point that's an interesting point to talk about is like in the slide here, the red plants, think of like pokeweed or uh, any annual sort of plants, even, even ragweed or uh, beefsteak plant, think of the sort of things that flush with nitrogen. They're annuals and they don't make complex molecules because they're not living for long periods of time. So they're just quick, fast growing annual sort of species. They just want to make seed and, and they don't need, they don't have very complex uh, metabolisms versus something like picture a, a gnarly, rough, thick leaved compass plant. That plant you know, if you ever smelled the sap or felt the sticky sap, it's full of alkaloids. It's full of amazingly complex interactive dynamics and, and molecules. The difference between those things, the difference between, say, uh, a real, real simple bodied nitrophilus plant, weedy sort of thing, and a compass plant, think of what 
kind of soil they would make as they rot back into the into the landscape. And so when you've got a system like this, you start getting things like broom sedge or poverty oats grass. They aren't the old growth in term product of an old growth sort of system, but they are more complex and they, they have the potential to build more complex soil than that earlier phase. So these this early stage here, we start getting these this the second wave, the first wave of, of, of perennial sort of species is the system rebuilding, literally starting to create that soil back again that proceeds a little little more and eventually the the annual nitrophilus things disappear and you start establishing a little more diversity a little more diversity we're talking decades we're talking centuries we may be talking millennia of rebuilding the system again from an old growth system which is old growth because old it's been there for a long time um so building that back up so, so so the sort of the take home here is that here's how these here's how these organisms interact and and if that was too complex and that there's a lot going on there, there's a lot of moving parts just take that knowledge now and then think about like some chaotic wood lot outside your door and in your neighborhood or a prairie that's just been an old field that's kind of approaching prairiness and think about how chaotic they are versus when you go into like really old growth sort of high quality nature how organized and structured and um, there's a there's a structural dynamic to that um old growth prairies old growth woods uh, become these stabilized ordered structured systems because below ground they are very ordered and structured uh, you disturb those it becomes a real chaotic sort of hot mess and there's a whole bunch of species that the key in to those chaotic stages of rebuilding or if you do any restoration type work you know this process well because when you're trying to make a ag field into a prairie you realize it just doesn't happen overnight and there are many steps in between and then eventually you're 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 home again. I mean, we 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 assume nobody's lived long enough to really see uh, the system come back. But we we assume that based on the trajectories that we can see that it that it does actually happen. So so that that's the sort of the plant soil interaction. The 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 plants are feeding into the microbia and healthy systems, and the microbia are reciprocating and making connections below ground with plants and they reach these sort of equilibria that are maximized biodiversity because if nature just is, does something long enough in perpetuity it com complexifies in that stability um kind of like if <clears throat> you're you're probably your most creative right after you're the most bored right you're really bored like, oh, what am I, I got nothing to do i'm gonna draw something next thing you know you've, you've made a masterpiece if you're busy you don't have time for that um, these these sort of slow processes are creative and uh, and functional sort of sort of sort of in their in their wonder. Zooming back out, uh, another fun aspect that's kind of related to this that I think is fun to talk about plant and soil interactions is this new thing discover a new process un, unheard of until published in in scientific journals in two thousand and eight. And in the last five years has really kind of blown up as a topic of, of research is, is this concept of rhizophagy, which I, I'm just blown away by and, and I geek out about it. So I've got to tell everybody I can about it. Uh, rhizophagy means root feeding. And again, here's a picture of, of root hairs on, on a plant, the, the fuzzy parts of, of a plant. Here's, uh, here's the root hairs in, a, in an illustration and then here a, a diagram on the right. And and so, the 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 tips of roots in plants have what's called the the very tip uh, is the root cap, and under that is the meristematic region. That's where like like basal cells, where uh, stem cells, undifferentiated material, they're just they're just they're just dividing and becoming undifferentiated cells that will eventually have to become like the inside of the root, there's like cortex and there's layers inside a root. If you ever taken a cross section of a carrot, there's structure inside of a carrot. Those are different kinds of cells. Before, in that, in that region of meristematic, they're, they're undifferentiated. 
And then there's a zone of elongation. The, 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 the root stretches out a little bit. And then after that, it produces these root hairs. And that's where the bulk of, of, of water and nutrient absorption come from is in the actual root hairs. Again, that surface area we talked about a while ago. So this process of rhizophagy, what it is, if you can look on the right side here, is that I'm gonna have to move this for me. Uh, starting on the on the bottom right of of the diagram, where we see microbes enter the root cells carrying nutrients. <laughs> so microbes, we're talking bacteria, fungi, protozoans, all these sort of different sing single celled sort of sort of microbes. They actually enter the the plant we we find is is making like these sugary, delicious, yummy substances that attract microbes. They're like they're like it's an ice cream shop. They run in there. Like, oh, this is great! And then they when they're inside the root, they enter to the tip. When those plant those microbes get inside the the plant, they start getting absorbed into the cells as the cells differentiate. So all of a sudden, these microbes are trapped inside of these cells. And then as they move up to the to the root hairs, the microbes are pushed to the ends of the root hairs. You can see them as these dark green uh, algae and microbia in those tips. Um, and, and, and scientists, when they saw this, were like, why is this happening? Why are plants luring microbia into their roots and then putting them in these root hairs? That's weird. And as they looked at it, they started tracing the the chemical reactions and stuff that were going on and what's going on is they lure the microbia into the cells and as soon as they get them absorbed into cells plants then start nailing them with these super oxidative compounds which are corrosive right plants make these corrosive compounds specifically to bombard these helpless little microbes that they've tricked into coming into the root the reason is because these microbes, a lot of them are are, are capable of fixing nitrogens and other molecules, other nutrients. Um, as they as they hit them with these corrosive compounds, it starts breaking down their cell walls, and the or the microbes, in order to build their cell walls back, start producing molecules that repair cell walls. Those repaired molecules that, that repair cell walls in microbes are often really highly rich in nitrogen potassium these sort of these sort of molecule these nutrients that plants need and then they just keep dissolving it away as the as the microbe keeps making more and more so it's in essence milking these microbes uh, and then they gets them out to these root hairs when it gets them in the root hairs they really hit them hard and so they're milking these microbes for nutrients and then at the end, they open the 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 micro to at the top. You can see the micro expulsion at the at the hair tips. The tips of the hairs open up and they let them go, and they're free free to go. But the fun thing is, the microbes go right back in. It's it's like a merry go round for them. It's just like an amusement park ride or something. They they go. They literally trace like the same ones coming and going back into the circle. Um, and so this is a this was not known before. We didn't know that plants were feeding and and sort of farming and milking microbes. And as they look into it, they start finding that that these microbes are often, if not exclusively, species specific. So every species has a group of these microbes that that they do this specifically for, and that they specifically lure or this relationship, or at least at least this relationship is 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 much more elaborate than just a passive relationship. Um, so that, that's kind of a, that's a plant soil relationship that we didn't really know. And a lot of people don't know about that in my mind is a very fascinating one. And I could, I could go on forever, but I, I'm mindful of the time, but that's a, that's a fascinating dynamic called rhizophagy. There's lots of great videos on it. It's a, it's a new sort of thing. And a lot of researchers with that are uh, tech savvy and YouTube savvy and, and, uh, Instagram savvy. There's a lot of videos of it. Just look up rhizophagy and videos, and you'll your mind will be blown because it, it gets a little it gets a little more elaborate than this. But that's that's a fascinating interrelationship with soils that we we don't often think of. And so here we are, just sort of thinking about these relationships in old growth systems. I can't I can't help but focus on that that idea. We have this notion of succession. If you know ecology. Um, 
you know what succession means if, if you don't know these dynamics it's literally how a forest fire burns down woods and then 150 years later becomes a forest again that process is is known as succession um but and that's a successional process and we're trying i'm kind of talking about soils in this sort of relationship but i want to also touch on one other thing the, the notion of restoring landscapes again we have these damaged landscapes across across uh, the world and regionally we, we try to restore a lot of these um, when we try to restore these beat up sort of ag fields and things like that a lot of prairie restorations go into what were former ag fields or fescue fields and stuff you have to start asking when was a prairie an old growth prairie ever an ag field so i'm going to go back a slide when in the successional gradient was there a parking lot? When in the successional gradient was there a, an agricultural field or a railroad station? Um, we have we have new elements in these relationships and in these processes that have never existed before. Um, and so we don't know what the developmental relationship of these sort of things is. So the question, when was a prairie ever an ag field, is kind of my tongue in cheek way of saying when we're restoring an ag field into a prairie, and we put a bunch of prairie plants together, just because the prairie plants are together doesn't mean the soil is prairie, you know? And uh, and that's, and not being a jerk about it, I'm just sort of saying we, we, we can't sort of mistake the above ground component for what's actually going on as an ecologically cohesive unit where the sky and the earth are one. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a heavier question. Um, Anyway, again, there's a there's a lot to talk about in the subject. There was just sort of some highlights that I thought were fascinating and, and relatable to conservation, ecology, native plant sort of people. I hope I touched on enough of those. Um, thanks for listening, and we may have time for questions. All right. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has a question, uh, you can drop it in the chat or um, feel free to unmute your mic. Any question, any question at all, I dare you. I'll ask you a question. So um, <clears throat> if, if you are trying to say restore a um, something that was like say fescue field and you're wanting to get it to a high quality prairie, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, do you recommend starting with like a lower C value species and working your way up or uh, is there a way to kind of uh, leapfrog or anything like that uh, with the C values for species? Yeah, that's, 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 that hypothetically works in the air. At least you can create species, you can create plant species assemblages that can look more and more prairie like um uh by doing that by you start with low c values and then start adding more c values i what i think we don't know because we don't have the sensory ability at this point is could could we be creating velveta cheese and we think we're making an a, a, a 60 year old aged gruyere you know are we making boone's farm wine when we think we're making dom perignon um, it, it may be prairie-like substance, but is it going to do, I think when we tell ourselves we made prairie-like substance, therefore it does everything a prairie did, um, it's because we don't understand what's actually going on at those, at those deeper levels. Um, so I think, I think we need to sort of become more cognizant of that. And, and if nothing else, it highlights, I know here in Missouri, the Missouri Prairie Foundation, it's, it's, it's forefront in their notion that if they get money to acquire properties, they want that money to primarily go to actual remnants rather than rest buying something and restoring it because you, because you can, you can like we all do, right. You can, you can buy an aged wine better than you can age one yourself. So um, that's, that's sort of that dynamic. So, so yeah, you can kind of work with the system to put plant assemblages together uh, I think I think we need to also also ask, are the deeper, more intricate dynamics an assumption or are they a reality? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a few comments here in the chat. Laura says, love, love, love this. Uh, Eileen Wilson says, absolutely fantastic. She will be returning to the video upload to take a longer look at those slides. Thank you. Uh, Laura also says uh, that they often think, wonder if uh, gut flora from animal feces, poo, as she calls it, uh, can be accelerating the comeback of any microbial diversity in the soil. Yeah, that's 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 kind of a something that we assume is probably a dynamic. I don't I don't know how how directly testable. It'd be a hard thing to test, and maybe there's research out there on it necessarily. Um, I I I do as a botanist and as, as somebody who does ecological cl data collection. There's there's a bit of contingency between people that are that are that feel that grazing puts these systems back together and there's people that feel that grazing on the same situation may actually slow the growth. And I don't, I don't, I'm not really married to either one of those camps. I think the truth is probably somewhere in between that it's all just a, a, a piece of the relationship. Um, but yeah, you, it would only make sense that, that sort of these, these high nutrient feces of, of animals um would would play a large part in the the microbial community of these systems and probably oh you know, yeah they're, they're part of the, the the cycling of these nutrients the scale to which i i worry a reason i'm a reason i'm kind of hem hawing around is like i i worry the scale to which that is 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 healthful to the plant community because i work in and i see a lot of places that had really great plant communities Somebody assumed animal grazing is what it was missing, and then it gets grazed really hard, and the plant community falls apart, and now you don't have that relationship that you wanted. Um, I, so I think maybe that's something to experiment with, not old growth systems. Yeah, and Laura wanted to clarify that uh, they're thinking more of all animals that belong, not just to grazers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, think of think of the think of the. 17 year cicadas and how much defecating they're doing as they're as they're pouring through soils yeah it's it's yeah it, yeah that scales of course so yeah anyone else have any questions for justin this is, is one that benefit a zombie you... ant on your last slide uh it's a it's a fly that's been uh been nailed by cordyceps which is a I think it's like a house fly of some sort, but yeah, definitely fungal, which I think is a beautiful thing. I say this is one of the benefits you get of attending our live webinars is getting to ask the speaker questions <laughs> versus watching the recording later. So I do want to encourage everyone, if you have a question, to make use of Jess's time. Eileen says uh, it makes uh, them think of native roaming species before industrial interruptions. Their habitat roaming would have been much larger. Uh, Laura says, thank you so very much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I would encourage everyone just sort of maybe as a as a as a final note is a is a picture systems as their below ground and above ground components and think of nitrogen think of think of chaotic simple systems as being high nitrogen systems the opposite of old growth and think of old growth high quality systems as being low nitrogen that simple like. Everywhere you go, driving down the highway, look, I mean, that's one of the, I do a lot of driving and I cover a lot of ground and I see a lot of stuff and it gets boring. So, I, but I, I entertain myself by looking at every field and every ditch and like that has this much nitrogen, that has much, this much nitrogen. You can you easily start realizing that, that, that high nutrient or, or a place where like a lot of nutrients is flushing into. If you live in uh, l more wet landscapes, like up North places that used to be large intact sedge wet prairie fen meadows and things like that 20 30 years ago that are turning into now are turning into reed canary grass and and phragmites and things that is a nutrient and cattails that's a nutrient problem that's that is nitrogen flushing into the system probably infinitely more of a nutrient problem than it is an invasive species problem and then you start then you start realizing 
a lot of our invasive species problem is a nutrient problem. Again, the plants are an emergent property of the soils. And, and, and most intact systems that I've ever worked in, that I do work in, and I work in a lot of them throughout the Midwest, the stable plant communities have, if they have invasive species problems, they're, they're at scales that I'm not really worried about. It's, it's the systems that aren't in that state that are either damaged or in recovery. That's where your invasive species are, are sort of a big thing. So understanding that aspect about soils, you start realizing that invasive species management and control really should be soil stabilization, soil health issue, not not blaming plants for just being manifestations of where they happen to be. Um, so, I mean, like, I, like you could take a bucket of bush honeysuckle seeds and put them in a, a high quality old growth system. And most of them aren't going to germinate. You put them in a beat up old, uh, old bottomland forest. That's all uh, covered with honey locusts or something. It's going to go crazy. So know that noting, knowing that metabolic difference makes the ecological problems make more sense. So so as the soil changes over time and the plant community uh, changes with that, um, I mean, the the way the, the nitrogen leaves, I mean, is it being off gas through like nitrous oxide? Um, I guess some of it may be leaching down uh, as water yeah. precipitate, uh, brings it further down to the profile of the soil. Yep. Um, so usable usable nitrogen is for plants is ionic form and it's it's highly leachable and, mm -hmm. and it's and it's readily usable. So if there's if it leaches out of a system, a lot of times it is a matter of just sort of letting the system leach out or stabilize. Um in other situations, if it's if it's becoming the the catching pool for that nutrient, which is what, which is a lot of bottomlands, a lot of wetlands. I mean, the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is, is 90% of that problem is agricultural nitrogen runoff. Um, so, so we, all systems are leaching nitrogen. It's just a matter of who receives them. Uh, wetland bottomland systems are, are used to a higher nitrogen load and those ecological systems are more adapted to it. So a, a high quality floodplain forest has twice the available nitrogen as an upland forest uh, simply because it's attuned to that degree of, of nitrogen. But we live in a landscape that is so destabilized and so simplified that these soil dynamics, I mean, we really are kind of starting over in my mind, we have to re-evolve the microbia back into our landscapes because they've seen things that have never, they've seen things that nobody should, that they never should have seen, you know, it's sort of, there's this trauma, it literally is trauma and we're traumatized, right? I mean, we, the degree to which we overcome our trauma as people is the degree to which the landscape overcomes its trauma. So uh, understanding it as, as being metabolic relationships though hard to do is infinitely more rewarding than than just like pointing fingers at at a japanese still grass and screaming at it so, so we have another question in the chat uh looks like eileen uh asks you said the more microbia the better so what encourages the growth of soil microbia uh the 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 primary answer there is is time and stability uh, so so as a system the the same thing you know when somebody wants to make a, a rich uh a rich microbial cheese or a rich microbial uh beer there's a lot of beers that have that sort of thing they're left they're caught they're kept at constantly stable states they're not fluctuated if you want to you want to ruin somebody's cheese at, you know like a, a fine cheese place you know go 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 play with the temperature dial um it'll it'll throw things out of whack so so stability is how these how these microbia how any system heals up it's, it's kind of i've done whole talks on the concept of stability just like in your life, you want your you 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 have a calendar and you keep a you keep a, a calendar and you, you get dates of what are coming up. 
and because you want to know what's ahead and what's coming on in the future. And when that thing, when your calendar starts falling apart, you start getting stressed out and worried. Every living organism has that same calendar. And so, so as long as something is relatively stable, life can adapt to it. And microbia adapts because they they reproduce, you know, a hundred times a day. They're, they're adapting faster, right? So if something can be stabilized and held intact um, as much as nature is, in, is intact, then complexity and these ecological dynamics can, can find predictive value and they can plan their, plan their day and plan their year and plan their decade. But if you're constantly changing things up, um, nothing stabilizes. And, that, and that's contrary to a lot of like ecological restoration and management for years has been this concept of always change up your burn cycle or always change up uh, this or, um, you know, that the, the heterogeneity and management makes makes richer landscapes. That doesn't hold. I mean, I've, I've spent 26 years collecting data in, on places where that is the idea and they just start falling apart more and more just in the same way that you don't want your day to day thrown up thrown into into chaos and so so you'll find stuff that that adapts to it i can't stress enough and it and, and it gets a little it doesn't really get woo but it gets a little outside people's comfort level is is that systems have the ability to just rebuild and complexify on their own we may have lost prairies that used to be we may have lost the woodlands that used to be we may have lost large tracts of landscapes that used to be these intact, really rich, uh, life-supporting systems, but they all have 100% the capacity to just put it back into place. It'll be a little different, and we'll lose stuff along the way. But um, I think we, I think we lose touch with the with the idea with the with the wonderful, amazing thing about ecological systems is is they always rebuild and restructure. Um, if we are open to how they rebuild and restructure and pay close attention, uh, we find that they do not, they do most of the work. We don't have to. Eileen says, awesome. Thank you. All right. So with that, uh, it is six Oh four. So, um, we will let you have your evening back. Thank you again, Justin, for another wonderful yeah. webinar. Really appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Looks like you're getting a, an applause from one of our audience members. Somebody has to clap. Uh, right. all up. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. And I think a, a side of uh, the, the plant world that we often forget about uh, soil, I think, is often uh, underappreciated uh, in, in many ways. So, uh, again, a, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So look for that later uh, next week uh, when I get a chance to get it up there. Uh, and you can watch the recording and go back and review anything that you uh, might have might have missed or might have uh, need a little additional time. And um, let's see, I'm going to drop uh, some links again in the chat so everyone has them. I encourage you to follow us on Facebook if you want to learn about more of these webinars. Uh, this is the last one of 2024, uh, but we will be coming back next year with another series uh, of native plant related uh, content for you. Our website, again, is ANPS.org. To join, ANPS.org slash join. Uh, Facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. And again, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Justin. Thank you.